Somebody has mommy issues. I've unofficially decided that January is Scandinavian Games Month. So, Brothers A Tale of Two Sons is a 2013 adventure game developed by Starbreeze Studios. Starbreeze Studios is based in Stockholm, which greatly influenced Two Sons, and was developed in close collaboration with Swedish-Lebanese award-winning film director Joseph Fares. Which explains why the fictional language and names in this Swedish game, based on Swedish folklore, are based on Arabic. The game had a relatively low budget, and the small team was made up of a large percentage of first-timers. This isn't a bad thing per se, but it meant a lot of things had to be scrapped and reworked during development, as the team got a better idea of what was and wasn't feasible. I will say, though, that the final product is pretty solid. I'm going to be spoiling almost the entire game freely, so consider this your warning. I'm going to be spoiling things in mostly chronological order, so if at any point you want to play the game yourself, I recommend pausing the video, taking note of the timestamp, playing the game yourself, and coming back to compare notes. The ending in particular is much more powerful if experienced blind, and the game is only two to three hours. But you better come back, I'll know if you don't. I got analytics. Anyway, our story begins with the youngest brother mourning at a gravestone. Just the happiest little game, isn't it? We are told through a flashback that the grave belongs to his mother, who drowned. The boy had been alone with her at the time, but his fear of swimming stopped him from being able to help her. He is interrupted by his older brother. Nayi! Nayi! Ta! Who needs help getting their sick father down the road to the healer? Using a card to push their father, the player can test out the controls and learn the hard way that they are not ambidextrous. Have I told y'all about the controls? In Brothers A Tale of Two Thumbs, both brothers are controlled by one player. With one controller. At the same time. I will say that despite the PC version technically being keyboard compatible, a controller is strictly mandatory. You control the older brother with the left stick and trigger, and the younger brother with the right. It's great symbolism and all, but in practice it takes some getting used to. When this game first came out, I remember a lot of people hated it for this reason, which is a real shame. Didn't they know they just had to become ambidextrous like me? Which is genetic, and decently uncommon. This is the part where a bunch of people comment about being ambidextrous, but at best they're cross-dominant, and at worst, they are flat-out lying for snowflake points. Either way, I'm sad to say complaints about the controls continues to this day going from the Steam reviews. Though it seems many are under the incorrect assumption that Brothers is a multiplayer game. 
Too bad the Steam page doesn't directly say it's a single player, oh wait. Anyway, a decent portion of the gameplay is puzzles and challenges testing your ability to simply control the brothers at the same time, and I suspect for most, a notable amount of focus is required to do anything in a timely manner. I even tested this out with a right-handed family member, and they described having to switch focus between the brothers constantly to keep the two close, let alone perform actions. This is in contrast to me avoiding focus on any particular brother with the occasional correction. So so the experience is still unique to my fellow ambidextrous, just in a near opposite way. While I like this unique mechanic, it seems to be a hard to pass gate, with some dropping the game because of it before finishing the first chapter. A lot of other games have much harder control schemes, and Brothers does a lot to help the player adapt. This being 2013 though, there wasn't as many Let's Players or such at the time to let people get a taste of the story, and realize the game was worth playing past the initial adjustment period required to adapt to the mechanics. Returning to the story, the brothers need to get their wheelbarrow-bound father to the nearby healer. If you want, you can return to the grave with the older brother and otherwise derp around. But just remember, your father is dying of whooping cough just down the road. The moving of the wheelbarrow is actually a decent warm-up and tutorial. While one brother can push and pull the cart alone, having both brothers work together makes a notable speed difference. The default positions of the brothers quickly establish that blue is best off on the left side of the screen and orange on the right, which is also the positions the brothers will take whenever both are needed to work or move a puzzle element. The brothers use a platform, and if you try to pull the lever with the younger brother, he simply can't do it, requiring the older brother to step in. Similarly, to get up a tall jump, the older brother must boost up the younger so he can send down a rope. Finally, there is the cranks, which require a circular motion with the thumbsticks to operate. Needless to say, all of these come back later in various forms and are best figured out now. Hey. After examining the father, he tells the boys there isn't much he can do. But there is hope. The boys need to get something from a magical tree. They agree, and quickly set off. <laughs> Leaving the coast side hills, we try to cross a bridge into town, but are stopped by the local bully. The younger brother is too small to fight him, and the older brother is far less violent than me, so instead we go around by crossing the river. This presents a new problem, though. The younger brother can't swim and has to cling to his brother in order to traverse the water. It is perfectly possible to leave your brother to drown. Though the window to recollect him is more than fair. After reaching the other side, we get back up to the road just in time to see the bully close the town gates on us, necessitating more climbing. Climbing in this game, like most of the other mechanics, is simple in nature. To hold on to something, hold down the action button, and if you press a direction, the respective boy will either climb towards that direction or reach out. If the boy is reaching outwards, then letting go of that button will have the boy leap in that direction. If you repress the action button while in the air, he'll grab whatever grabbable object he comes into contact with. The game will definitely play around with this, but for now, we are just strafing our way over the town walls. 
traveling through the boys' hometown gives an interesting window into their daily lives. We can get glimpses of various people being busy as we pass the docks and square. Some townsfolk are rude or flat-out aggressive towards the boys. Others are welcoming and seem to wish the boys well. The interactions the boys have with the people vary on who you use to talk with. The older brother is usually more polite and focused on the quest, while the younger brother is rude and often causes mischief. The younger brother is good with animals and the arts, while the older brother is more physically capable. In the past, I've compared them to a warrior and a bard, and I still think that makes a good comparison to their general dynamic. Puzzles often require smart use of the brothers. For example, when we reach the town's kennel, the bully traps us in a gated yard. Again, I would have kicked this kid's ass by now, but our kind-hearted brothers have other plans. The bars blocking the path around the yard are too thick for the older brother to pass, but the younger brother can easily slip through and let loose a nearby dog to chase him. Did I say the boys were kind-hearted? I meant opportunistic. Another good example of picking which brother you use for what is the bridge out of town. The watchman is asleep, and for whatever reason, the boys can't just pull the drawbridge lever themselves. The older brother tries to wake the man, but to no avail. The younger brother has a more drastic way of waking people up, though. Now that the Watchman is awake, but soaked to the bone, he'll just get angry when interacting with the little brother. So you'll need the big brother to talk to him, and convince him to lower the gate so they may pass. Again, an incredibly simple puzzle, but now it ensures that you will remember to try the other brother should a task be impossible for one. Just beyond the town is some farmland. And, just like the town, there are different people to interact with, ranging from a woman sweeping dirt on her dirt lawn, a little girl who invented basketball in medieval Sweden, this guy, a drunk, and this gentleman who totally doesn't mind it when two random kids run up and mess with his heart. There are also little optional stories throughout the game, many of which are in this little section. We can release a bird from captivity, throw the little girl's basketball down a well to make her cry, and even solve rabbit racism with... blackface. I'm not kidding. These little stories are really nice, and sometimes don't have payoffs until way later in the game. I'll point out some of the bigger ones later on, but if you need a list of clues, pretty much all of them have associated Steam achievements. At some point, the boys must pass a field with an angry guard dog. One brother has to hop between hay bales while the other distracts the dog. General platforming, including climbing up short ledges, are controlled like a Zelda game, with jumping and such all being performed automatically. Only tall structures incorporate the climbing mechanics I mentioned earlier. There is also no consequences for death outside of a short animation, and being resetted back to the beginning of the challenge. If you couldn't tell by now, this game was meant to be a story-focused casual experience. This is probably a good time to properly address the fictional language of this world. As I mentioned before, it is based on Arabic, but it's not an exact copy. There are exact translations to the words, but there definitely isn't simlish levels of vocabulary or use. The people are all very expressive, and figuring out what they're saying comes pretty naturally, which is commendable. If you pay attention, you can also pick up the names of the brothers. Naya is the older brother, while Nayi is the name of the younger. Hey, Nayi! Naya! For the sake of clarity though, and my own inability to remember names, I will continue to call them by their ages for this video. Back to the story, the brothers gradually make their way up the mountainside to the home of a large troll. It always threw me off that this large troll lived spitting distance from the village and no one seemed to care. Bro also needs some serious fungal cream. Either way, the neighborhood friendly troll is sad about something. The boys ask for directions and the troll offers to help them traverse the mountain eventually leading them into some caverns filled with old steampunk-style machinery. It's not immediately obvious, but this is the start of Chapter 2. Chapter 1 sets up a lot of elements in a short amount of time, and all without proper dialogue. Even though your father is dying, most of the chapter feels oddly laid back in that Sunday afternoon sort of way. The obstacles for the boys so far have been mundane things, like dogs and bullies. It is a notable contrast to the later chapters, and sets up a good feeling of leaving the comfort of home in order to go on this big, dangerous journey. 
The mining caverns the troll has taken us to are quite large. Large waterways and fountains, as well as a nice view, keep the location from becoming claustrophobic. But our progress through is almost entirely dependent on the machinery. We have to climb over water wheels, jump across gaps, and ride on cargo hooks. Of special note is that some of these puzzles are slightly advanced versions of previous challenges. For example, remember moving our father's cart? Well, now you need to move the cylinder the same way. Only now you have to angle it through a short maze. Simple mechanics from before are now being utilized in new and slightly more advanced ways. This is some Game Design 101 shit, but I've seen plenty of games, especially recently, that don't seem to understand this principle. Take note, future game designers. After operating and or destroying dangerous machinery, and watching trolls mine from a safe distance, we come across a curious scene. Well, you know how the troll was sad before? It turns out his wife has been kidnapped by an ogre. Using the little brother, we swipe the key from the ogre's belt and free her. But then, this little shit decides it would be a brilliant idea to yell after her. Hey, Maro! Shh, yeah. Naturally, it alerts the ogre, starting a boss battle. Using the two brothers, you have to trap the ogre in the cage in the middle of the room. Only the older brother can pull the lever that opens the auto-closing cage door, so you have to use the slower, younger brother to angle the creature inside. After the fight, the troll woman returns with a chain the boys can use to climb up to her, and after a few more puzzles, the three reach the exit where the main troll man is waiting for them. Except the ogre has caught up. <laughs> this second phase is much closer to a traditional boss battle. Using one of the brothers, you have to taunt the ogre into rush tackling the pillars. eventually loosening the chains off the trap door in the middle. Using the younger brother to taunt the ogre to walk over the platform, use the older brother to pull the lever. Then in an oddly comedic scene, the ogre manages to hold onto the ledge and you must use both brothers to loosen his fingers in synchronization. Once free of the ogre, the brothers and friendly trolls all leave the caverns. The trolls are thankful to the boys and send them off deeper into the mountains. The Troll Chapter, while not particularly jaw-dropping, is a decent enough section. While there were a lot of interesting things to interact with in town, the caverns are just one puzzle after another for the most part, and while that isn't necessarily a bad thing, I can see as an early frustration to players, who are most likely still trying to figure out just how to move properly, or are playing the game for the story. I personally like it well enough, but I would argue the other chapters are just simply more interesting. A good start to the adventure, but definitely a warm-up section more than anything. Chapter 3 is a notable departure from the previous chapters. Taking place on a dark and cold night, the tone shifts dramatically to that of a horror story. The boys have set up camp, but in the dark, early morning hours, they get some unwanted visitors. Night. 
Man-eating wolves have begun to harass them, and a single torch is all that keeps them at bay. The younger brother can't grab a torch for himself, so it's important to keep the two brothers close. Even with the light, there will be at least one wolf inching closer to see what he can get away with. Though leaving the light spawns in an impatient wolf looking for some fast food. If a wolf gets too close to either brother, it's game over, so it's best to take this section slow. To add to the tone, you pass a hanging tree some way down the road, but YouTube doesn't want me to show you that. It's an interesting shift and a good taste of the more unfriendly themes to come. Ironically, safety comes in the form of a graveyard. The graveyard in particular is presented well, shown to be a place of rest rather than fear. The wolves don't attack you here, and the well-lit area is a man-made sanctuary in these wild and dangerous woods. Even the gravekeeper is a relief, being cranky but helpful to the boys, in contrast to the often unhelpful village people from the first chapter. This moment of reprieve is short though. Once leaving the graveyard, the wolves attack again, and this time there is no torch. I will say that it always bothered me how quickly the older brother would drop his torch once reaching the graveyard. While it is twilight by the time you leave, the threat of the wolves just behind you should be enough to keep the torch or wait until morning. Well, this decision immediately comes back to haunt him. <sighs> <sighs> Remember to have the younger brother hold on to the older one. Accompanied by funeral water lanterns, the boys are pulled downstream by the rapids. Avoid the rocks and grab onto this final outcropping just before the waterfall. It's not long though before they're back in the water. <laughs> This time, the brothers are in separate streams, and we really get to see the limitations of the younger brother swimming. He's desperate to stay afloat, all while his older brother is trying his best to instruct him. While the river drops the older brother to the shore, the younger brother is thrown over the waterfall. <laughs> saved just barely by a cliff edge. Under his brother's instructions, the boy grabs onto a large root. which quickly loses hold under the weight. This leads to an interesting section, where the younger brother must hold on to the root while the older brother pulls it to safety. To make matters worse, living roots sprout hands that grasp at the boy. In gameplay, the player is using one character to control the horizontal movement while the other controls the vertical. It's an interesting shift. It's also a relatively short section, at only a minute long. From a thematic standpoint, it makes sense. But for a gameplay shift, it is tragically short. Either way, just short of reaching safety, a trench sprouts from the rock face and pulls the branch down. The older brother immediately goes after the younger, with the two both falling to the pond below. The next scene is haunting. Scenes depicting underwater rescues are often shot beautifully, and this is no exception. Cold twilight and warm funeral lamps light the surface as the older brother rescues his sibling. We cut to the younger brother being dragged to shore. <laughs> The boy is fine, and after a few coughs, he is up and ready to move on. 
The atmosphere is immediately different from before, though. While the beginning of the chapter was a classic horror set, this is now ghostly and ethereal. The music swells louder, this time with the same vocal echoes of the beginning scene. The once clear night is coated in fog, and the boys wander through, barely able to see. A giant figure rests in the waters, offering them a hand. Warm whispers speak to the boys as their mother pulls them close to her face. The older brother turns his head away while the younger approaches. The boy hugs his mother's giant form as best he can, but upon turning back to his brother, something is clearly wrong. He is dazed and having trouble standing. The player takes control of the younger brother, and as the camera turns, we can see the dying father trapped in the mother's fingers. She'll eventually pull her hand from him. As the dream loses its solidity more and more, the young boy tries to check on his father, but as he does, his older brother comes up and promptly strangles him to death. The boy wakes up on the side of a pond, his brother clearly having just given him chest compressions. Relieved, both brothers hug each other, glad that they're safe and alive. While this game is far from subtle, and basically the entire thing is a series of metaphors, this is probably the least subtle section. I'll let it slide, as the set pieces were good and it is justified thematically. But I will say I'm not a fan of the whole trope of using a surrealist dream to shove the metaphor in your face. I always feel that metaphors are best expressed in a thematically natural way, and just putting it all in a dream is upsettingly close to telling rather than showing. I think now would be a decent enough breakpoint for us to talk about a lesser but present theme of this story, familial preference. Usually, when we think about favoritism between parents and children, we think about the all-too-common, mentally detrimental kind. The whole golden child, parents favorite sort of situation. That's definitely worth talking about as it victimizes both the often ignored or otherwise lesser treated child and the favored but often overpressured golden child. The former is emotionally discarded or worse, while the latter is often spoiled and sheltered or placed under a lot of pressure and expectations. But the familial favoritism in Brothers, Tale of Two Sons, is something a lot more common and benign. The preferences children have between their parents. It's not exactly subtle, but younger brother preferred his mother while the older prefers their father. The younger's dream, along with being the only one to visit her grave in the opening cutscene, makes it clear that he deeply misses her, and the way he goofs around almost immediately after starting the journey suggests he doesn't hold his father to the same amount of reverence. That isn't to say he doesn't care about his father. It's just the thought that his dead mother is more prevalent than the thought of his ill father. In contrast, the older brother seems to worry about his father a lot more than he mourns his mother. His default interaction with strangers is to ask for directions. While taking care of his brother is his number one concern, he is still letting him into insanely dangerous situations so they keep moving. Again, this doesn't mean he doesn't miss his mother or mourn her loss, but rather he is more focused on curing his father. Now, the immediate assumption would probably be that the parents also favored a specific child. After all, the mother and younger brother were out alone when she drowned. But since we didn't get to see their lives before the journey, a lot of different factors could be at play here instead. It is completely possible that the parents treated the boys as equal as expected. Maybe the father took well with the first son and the mother took up the slack with the second. Maybe the ages are a prime factor. The mother may have spent more time with the younger brother because the father was already busy with the first. Maybe the mother was focusing on the younger more because he is still a child. The older brother is a young man and is definitely at the age where the father would be teaching him various skills useful in his upcoming independence. Maybe, once the younger brother is older, the father will shift his attention to him? 
as I said, there are a lot of factors at play. Since the narrative is from the eyes of the brothers, and only encompasses the length of the journey, all we are seeing is the obvious visual clues of their dynamic. I'm mainly focusing in on it because we don't see it often in fiction, even though I see it all the time in person. It'll also come up later in the story and how certain things are framed, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, returning to the story, the boys walk up on a man trying to, uh, remove himself via rope. It's a small optional puzzle to cut him down or not. If you fail, you get a short and grim cutscene of the boys watching his final moments before moving on. If you succeed in saving him, he just breaks down crying. Nearby is the ashen remains of a house, along with the bodies of a dead woman and child. It's obvious what happened here. No words are needed. While you can leave the man alone to mourn and likely try again to practice his rope tying skills at a later date, you can also investigate the ruins of his home a bit more. On the edge, just over the cliff and lit up by god rays, is a music box. You can bring it back to the man, giving him the willpower to live on. A bit further up the road, after a brief windmill puzzle, the boys steal some goats. Unlike all goats in the history of forever, these guys don't mind you riding on their backs. The boys ride those babies along the cliffside in a surprisingly quick but fun section. Hope you're not afraid of heights. Towards the top of the cliff, we meet Albert Einstein, who has been inventing some kind of glider reminiscent of early aircraft. Yes, I know, just roll with it. We play hot potato with the gear to fix an elevator, and in return, Einstein gives us his flying machine. Wow, that is not an equal trade. I like to think he is just using the boys to test out the machine so we die instead. Before we head off, real quick, take a look through the inventor's telescope. While you can see the place we are about to go to, you can maybe see something else as well. If you release the caged bird back in chapter 1, he's now on a perch within your view. If you focus in on him, you get this little scene. How cute! And it's a nice payoff for our previous actions. When ready, grab a glider to set off. The glider section is actually rather nice. You get a beautiful shot of the sweeping scenery and a small breather. If you are going at a breakneck pace, you are required to take a moment to breathe. Up until the birds puncture holes in the wings. The glider starts to fall apart, with you still alarmingly high above the ground. The boys are forced to land on a high plateau where a ruined castle is. Thankfully, it doesn't belong to Dracula. It belongs to a giant. Traversing the castle is no cakewalk. Getting past the Dark Souls ass bridge requires the players to alternate swinging one brother with the other via a rope. I know these boys probably have great upper body strength, but damn. These boys can sticky wall man their way to freedom like their father's life depended on it. Once in the castle, we appear to be in a study room. Making sure to track our dirty shoes all over the bed and books, we get up onto the giant's desk. The giant has been studying a griffin-like creature that he has trapped on the desk. 
Free the bird, and although she is clearly injured, she will fly you to the next section. Funny enough, she used to be a boss battle. The boys would steal an egg from her and would keep it away long enough she would die from sorrow. I'm glad they cut it because I'm sure having a section where the boys emotionally torture a cute griffin to death probably would have ruined my image of them. Instead, we get a lovely aerial shot and a new friend. The bird gets us to the next plateau before promptly falling dead. Bleh. We get a moment with the older brother, where he reflects on his time spent with his father. It's only a moment, but it confirms any suspicions that he favors their father in the same way the younger brother favored their mother. It's also nice to get some narrative input from the older brother, seeing as the younger is clearly the main character of the two. This next section is probably my favorite. A foggy valley is up ahead, and it holds a gruesome sight. A battle between giants had recently taken place here, and the land is littered with massive bodies of fallen soldiers. Blood still pours from their wounds, and gravity has yet to fully settle. There is something haunting about the dead body of a recently deceased giant. It's not particularly common in fiction. In fact, I can only think of a couple other pieces of media that fully invoke the trope. The view of such a large individual dead and rotting invokes a feeling that a simple giant skeleton just doesn't. The giant's graveyard just wouldn't be as powerful if it was just a bunch of clean, sun-bleached bones like we often see in fantasy settings. What we do get is much more memorable and rare. This place was alive just hours earlier, and now the quiet of death is all that remains. A quiet that the boys must now disturb in order to cross and continue their journey. The boys move limbs, disturb feasting birds, push bodies off cliffs, and swim through rivers of blood. You even get to cleave off a giant foot. In fact, the boys are pretty awful to the dead here, though I can't help but wonder how the giants had a battle in such a thin strip of land surrounded by cliff falls. One body in particular is blocking our exit from the area. In a haunting detail, he has died sitting up and covering a wound, making him look alive save for his lack of breath. The boys have no choice but to move him though, which they must do by shooting him with a giant's crossbow. <laughs> Following the river of blood, the boys enter what looks to be tribal lands. The ritualists are using the giant's blood to worship their four-armed god. Their wall depicts their history and rituals, and this is one of those changes on a second viewing sort of things. Just a bit ahead, we see an alarming sight. Tribesmen are about to sacrifice a young woman, and the boys aren't just going to stand around and let it happen. Drenching themselves in blood, they disguise themselves as the tribe's four-armed god and free the woman. The three make a break for it, running to a nearby cave and the next chapter. Though, you don't really need to run fast. The tribesmen don't actually follow or attack, but... Shh. The trio hop onto a boat and we begin down a river into probably the slowest moving section of the game. Alright, I have to say it, this boat controls like ass. It acts like it's giving you control, but at the same time it is railroading you down a very thin line. If you fight it at all, even on accident, you'll have to struggle for a hot minute to realign the boat. Please game, either let me drive or you take full control. None of this one hand on the steering wheel shit. Each brother rows on one side, so you have to alternate between brothers to steer the boat. 
But as mentioned before, the boat tends to have a mind of its own, and you'll likely fight it more than once. We traverse the icy waters. Clearly, we have left the fairy tale forest in favor of the harsh but beautiful Arctic. The world has shifted from warm colors to cold whites and blues. The only interruptions of the cool colors are the faded warms of the boat and its passengers, and the strikingly strong colors of the River of Blood. Danger lurks in these waters, though. Orcas, to be exact. But don't worry, it's not like killer whales are known for being dangerous- oh wait! They won't actually attack you, but if you float over them, they'll breach on top of you and the window to avoid them is rather small. Thankfully, surface bubbles give you a brief warning to row backwards. We reach land and start ice flow hopping, leading us to a... Is that a motherfucking Lapras? Who's that Pokemon? Copyright infringement. All jokes aside though, these totally not Lapras turtles are pretty cute and immediately sympathetic, which is important to establish quickly for our next side story puzzle. The Lapras' babies have been beached on their backs, somehow, and the brothers can push them back into the water via a slip and slide. The fun bit about this is that it's completely optional. Many of the best moments of this game are the side stories, which is great incentive to being thorough in your exploration. Moving on, the trio come across a strange fort town filled with statues of humans mid-work pose. It quickly becomes obvious that the inhabitants of this town have been turned to snow, and not just them, but also the army outside their gate. So what do our young heroes do? Destroy a bunch of them, by rolling them over with their own catapult, of course. I mean, how else are we going to get into the fort? A side path? Psh, nah. We have to catapult ourselves over the wall. Duh. <laughs> what else are catapults for? It's not like we'll die and break our ankles. But who exactly did all this? How about a giant invisible monster? Maybe? Either way, there is a giant invisible monster in the fort that you now have to get past. It's also right around here we start to notice how weirdly athletic our lady friend is. Not only does she run faster than both the boys, but she can jump like a spider monkey. Like a spider monkey! And her way of crossing over this log is... interesting? We find the road out of the fort, but the monster is patrolling it. Taking lead from the girl, you have to position both the boys behind the snow people and pose them so the creature doesn't see them. It's a fun but intense mix of hole in the wall and red light green light. It doesn't work for long though, and the monster gives chase. If he catches up, you are treated to a brutal ground slam death animation. <laughs> Navigate your way past all the snow people and be careful not to get caught on any of them. Thankfully, the monster is quite heavy, and the bridge exiting the fort crumbles under its weight. <laughs> Joyful victory! And it seems that in the moment of danger, the girl has become quite smitten with the eldest brother. An interesting contrast, she is actually a bit rude to the younger brother in their few interactions, and he now returns the sentiment. Look at these teenagers getting their hormones everywhere. Gross. For this next section, the game turns the beauty slider up to 11. Gorgeous arctic landscapes are framed by the northern lights. This is a far cry from the dark and gloomy forest of the previous night, but it is no less dangerous. The woman leads the boys to a tunnel pass through the mountain. 
And while the older brother trusts her completely, the younger doesn't. Still, they must press on. The tunnel is dark and narrow, and it is immediately obvious something is wrong. Sure enough, Trapped, the boys wake up in the spider's nest. A boss battle ensues. The older brother is free roaming while the younger brother is trapped in a ball of web. The spider woman quickly leaps onto the older brother, pinning him to the ground. Use the younger brother as a wrecking ball to slam into her. Now free, the older brother can rip off one of her legs. It's, again, rather brutal, though this time the game acknowledges it. This pattern repeats until the spider woman has been nearly dismembered. Once the spider is down to her last legs, she tries to drag herself away, clearly in pain. The older brother goes in for the kill. He rips off her next leg and... He gets stabbed by her sharp pedipalps. Elsewhere, the father, still sick and dying, wakes up in a cold sweat. Coughing, he tries to leave, but can't even stand. Returning to the boys, the eldest is alive, but barely. The youngest is helping him stand, but it is clear he doesn't have long. In a moment of mercy, the tree of life the boys have been journeying to is just beyond the spider woman's lair. Keeping up the theme of gorgeous landscapes, the tree is magnificent and literally glows with life. That is little comfort for the brothers, though. The younger one must climb the tree quick if he wants to save his brother. He races to the top, passing a giant nest as he does. In a glowing pool at the top is the water of life. He fills his canteen and slides back down to his brother as fast as he can. Naya! Naya! 
It's too late. He was only gone for a few moments, but that was too long. His brother is dead, ironically, at the base of the Tree of Life. The younger brother is beyond heartbroken, and hopefully so is the audience. We've spent the last three or so hours with these boys, and now one is dead. To twist the knife in the wound, the younger brother must now bury the older and the player is in control for the entire scene. The boy is sluggish and drained. If you use the older brother's controls during this time, <laughs> the younger brother will break down crying. <laughs> As he mourns, the bird returns, alive and well. She lives in the tree, and seems to be unharmed, despite dropping dead earlier. The bird invites the younger brother onto her back, and they take off for home.
The boy has been dropped off near his home. We retrack across previous elements, only this time without the older brother. That becomes a problem quickly when we come up to the water we must swim across. With the encouragement of our mother, we gain the strength of our older brother. To use the strength of our brother, we simply press his old activation button. You will hear his voice encouraging us along, and if you are using a controller, it will start to vibrate. With the help of his mother and older brother, the young boy can reach his father just in time. Abi. Heno, heno. Some time later, the sun is out, and it's a beautiful day. We run up to meet our father. That was Brothers, a tale of two sons. I'm sad to say that for the most part, the music of Brothers is made up of mostly forgettable orchestrals, but it is high quality within that realm. The end credit song is of special note as it incorporates the setting more than the other tracks. This is also two for two of our Scandinavian games to incorporate non-lyrical female vocals like this.
so I made a point to look up what it's called this time, but had no luck. I got my foot stuck in the yoik rabbit hole, but none of the examples I found matched what I was looking for. If you're someone with actual musical knowledge, could you tell me what the female vocals in the soundtrack of both Brothers and Northern Journey are called? Anyway, outside of reliving the narrative or catching a missed side story, there isn't any notable reason to replay the game. There are achievements. You can easily get them all in a single playthrough, but you might have missed one or two if you weren't doing the optional side stories. There aren't many though, and this is actually the first Steam game I got all the achievements on. There is an easy chapter select, so you won't be playing for too long if you decide to go back for anything you missed. Though not available on all versions, some ports have a developer's commentary. Outside of that, the replayability is similar to that of a DVD with a couple bonus features. Speaking of ports, the Switch re-release has a multiplayer mode, but I firmly believe this defeats a major and vital design element of the game, so I can't help but condemn this change on principle alone. It's a classic case of artistic vision being sacrificed to appeal to a wider demographic. For future reference, I'm on team gatekeep the things you love in their artistic vision from people who wish to change it. But Brothers isn't the right game for me to include my reasoning and speech about it. Traditionally, this discussion is saved for a game where high gameplay difficulty is vital to the game's artistic vision. But even if I cover a game like that in the future, I feel other, better essayists have already explained the stance well enough. Okay, so while I was editing the final touches on this review, they announced that Brothers will be getting a remake soon. To be honest, this was 100% a surprise to me, and I wouldn't have even known in time if my sister hadn't brought it to my attention. Going from the trailer itself and the scenes they show, it seems the remake will be identical to the original in terms of story beats. While the graphics have definitely had an update, I feel the new look is a bit drab compared to the old and perfectly fine graphics. I'm also surprised to see the beige filter make a return after so long. I also reserve the right to make fun of the brother's new hair. The older brother now looks like a boy band reject, and the younger is just short of a Squeenix protagonist. I don't know if they're going to change the control scheme at all, but if they made it multiplayer, or otherwise not controlling the brothers separately, but at the same time as a single player, I will consider it a betrayal of the original vision. At the end of the day, I wouldn't say I'm hyped, as I think the original game is still perfectly fine, and I don't really like the changes in the visual style. But if it means more people might enjoy the story and gameplay, then I won't complain. <laughs> Alright, sorry if this section is rushed. It was a genuine surprise to me that this game is getting a remake, and I'm just happy I was alerted in time to get this edit in. Okay, back to the show. For a 2013 indie game, Brothers is pretty solid. It's a rare and well-done example of using controls to enhance the narrative, and while this makes it unwelcoming to some, I think it goes a long way to making the game unique and memorable. The story is a good fairy tale odyssey told in a nice and concise length. While the older brother's death is rather predictable, what with the younger brother obviously having the main focus throughout the game, the actual scene itself really delivers. Overall, I highly recommend this game for anyone interested in narrative-focused games, assuming they can handle the controls. I have a couple more Scandinavian folk games on reserve, so I wasn't kidding about making it a January tradition. I still really appreciate all the support I've been getting, and I genuinely have trouble breathing from all the joy it brings me. I hope you guys have a good year and good fortunes all around. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a sister to go bother. Bye! Ten years old, but I'll beat your ass.